Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 39. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We are back from the Shetland Wool Week and we know a lot of you are very eager to hear all about it. So we're really excited about sharing our experiences with you. We have been really busy. We were recording <laughs> interviews and taking other footage of other activities going on. It is more than we can fit into a single episode. So we'll be giving you a good dose of Shetland Wool Week today and we will have more Shetland content in upcoming episodes. Yeah. But today we've organised two interviews for you. So first up, you're going to meet Hazel Tyndall, who is a very well-known and respected Shetland knitter and teacher. And Hazel has twice been given the title of the world's fastest knitter. And then later on in the program, you're going to meet Dr. Carol Christensen, who's the curator of the textile collection at the Shetland Museum and Archives. And Dr. Carol Christensen has very kindly put together a small collection of some of her favourite early 20th century Shetland hand-knitted garments, especially to show and talk about for you on the podcast. Yep. In addition to the interviews, we have some other footage of activities that we did and places that we saw. Andrea has a new project on her needles. She has also made some purchases, which you will enjoy seeing. And we've got a new cow to announce coming up. Um, all um, show notes can be found at fruityknitting.com. That includes full program notes and full contact details for all of our guests. So we're going to start off with just a short seven minute piece of footage or film of the various um, events that took place during Shetland Bull Week. We've actually only been to one other yarn festival and that was the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, which we loved. We had a great time there. Yep. It's a good festival. But um, the Shetland Wool Week had quite a different atmosphere to it. And I think Shetland is such a mecca for fibre artists because it's got such a rich history and heritage and culture of wool and therefore spinning, knitting and, and weaving. And um, so that meant that there was a lot of really interesting activities happening on all the islands around in Shetland. And so you could get your normal uh, classes that you normally get at a yarn festival for knitting, spinning or weaving. But on top of that, there was ex exhibitions, there was open demonstrations in walk-through uh, studios. So you could go there and, and watch people doing their work and ask some questions. There was also open talks and uh, tours and just a whole lot of other general knitting events. Yeah. Yeah, so the feeling of the festival was very much about uh, learning and experiencing and, and sharing with other knitters, which was really nice, and also um, about enjoying the region because Shetland and the surrounding islands are absolutely beautiful, and we were very lucky that we could do that, and we also had some great weather. So We did. It was really worth going that way too. Yeah, and there's a, a maker's market there that was quite a relaxed event that was just on one day. Um and the other thing I noticed was that there was a real concentration of very serious and accomplished knitters who came, so both as visitors and also naturally the locals who live there. And there are a few uh, local knitter and spinner guilds and they had their open events and you could come there and you could sit down next to an expert, you could watch them doing their craft, you could ask them questions about it, you could even ask them for guidance on your own projects and they were really open and generous and eager, actually, to share their knowledge with you. So it was really about learning, experiencing and, and developing your craft. So I could imagine that if you just turned up to the Wool Week and even didn't do any classes but just hung, up, hung out with these, you know, experts, that it would really yep. take your knitting or your spinning to a new level. Yeah. What about me, Dals? Do you think my knitting has jumped to a, a new level? <laughs> well, I think that we were so busy that you didn't actually get much knitting yeah, done, did There wasn't you? much knitting. No, there wasn't a lot of knitting <laughs> done on my part. But maybe by osmosis you absorbed yeah, something. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to see some of this footage coming up and I hope you enjoy it. Sunday evening was the opening ceremony which was fully booked with around 350 people attending. So at the door you were greeted with a glass of wine or drink of your choice and then you could meet up with friends or other famous faces, sit down with some finger food and wait for the show to begin. The band that was playing is called Fair, it's a four-piece Shetland band and they play a mixture of traditional and new music. They played at the beginning and during the fashion show. 
Of course, I am extremely honoured um, to have been asked to be this year's patron. Um, it means a lot to me that the Shetland community gave me that endorsement. Um, it's also of personal um, significance to me this year because my mum passed away um, in January and uh, she was an knitwear designer here in Shetland in the 70s. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of first timers um, here this week as well. So I can guarantee you that you're going to fall in love with the landscape and the people. Um, so have a fantastic week. I mind learning for you just by watching your hands. Maybe I can mark after all. I mind thinking it would be fine to get to the stage and I don't have to think about marking. At the end was the fashion show showing various designers' works. This is Elaine Nicholson, Ram Knitwear, Di Gilpin, and Gudrun Johnston. The War Week was centred around the Shetland Museum and Archives in Lerick, and as you walked into the entrance foyer, you saw very grand installations made from wool and fleece. The area which they called the hub was where you could relax and knit and you had free tea and coffee. It was a really beautiful and relaxing room and it had wonderful photos of various Shetland fibre artists and sheep farmers on the surrounding walls. This is outside the museum on a lovely evening and as you can see we just had the most amazing weather for most of the week. I mind sitting among you listening to you speak and gaff and share. I mind learning for you just by watching your hands. Maybe I can mark after all. I mind thinking it would be fine to get to the stage and I don't have to think about marking. It would be fine for it to just happen. I need time for that to happen and practice. I certainly need practice. I mind thinking that your hands were soft and gentle. I mind thinking that you minded me of my grandmother. I mind thinking that I must sit in with her, like I was sitting with you and just speaking. <coughs> speaking as the needles click together, sparking memories for long ago. I mind thinking it was lovely to see you read the, the poems that Laura brought along. Words about marking. I think you enjoyed that. I mind wondering at how the hands mind. But that comes back to practice, doesn't it? I mind that I never really practice. I mind wondering at how thy hands tell me so many stories in such a short time. I mind walking away that day thinking that Yun was a lovely way to spend an afternoon. And I must mind and visit you again for mere yarns. Here we are with Gudrun Johnston and Mary Jane Mucklestone's group at Barrister House. We were their guests for dinner on the Friday night and we had a really fun time with them all. It was a gorgeous 18th century house on the remote west side of Shetland. And the owner was an exceptional chef and we had a fantastic three course meal with him. It was a really fun and intimate evening. It was exactly what we needed.
Coming back from Burristow House on that evening, we had a reasonably long drive through the moorlands in the dark. It was almost a full moon, I think, yeah. clear night. Um, Starry sky. We, we had a couple of incidents with the small animals out there. Um, I was thinking of echidna, but it was actually a hedgehog that we yeah. saw the first time in this part of the world. Um, on the road and really quite content, not phased by our headlights or our car when we got quite close to him, so we stopped. You got out and had to move him along. Yeah. And then we went on again and we came across a weasel on the road. And, again, he wasn't going to move for our car. He stayed there and you got out. And he was actually just wanting to finish his meal. He had a frog on the road. Um, I think the frog came to a bad end, but the, the weasel was benefiting and he just wanted to finish his meal and then he would move out of the way. Yeah. So I got out. <laughs> The, the headlights are on him and he's just there in the road chewing away on this frog. And I walk almost up to him and he's like, oh, can't you just leave me alone? I want to finish my meal in yeah, peace. Yeah. And then finally he goes off and leaves the little frog's legs on the road. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just an amazing time because the starry sky and you're, you're in the middle of nowhere. It's just wonderful. And so that was a great fun adventure just yeah. to see these two creatures. But then the rest of the, the way home I was thinking, I should have moved his meal to the edge of the road because I'm sure the next car yeah. is not going to stop. Although I think he was probably okay. There wasn't a lot of traffic there. Yeah. These are these are one-lane roads, right? So you can't put two cars side by side. It's just the one lane and sheep on either side of the road. And if you want to pass a car, then you go to a passing point. You will see that in a video coming up. Yeah. But, yeah, I think it was probably fine. But, yeah, it was just a lovely, another lovely experience that yep. we had. Yep. So I'm very keen to show you my latest project that's on the needles now. Back in episode 30, I interviewed Sissel Hujevik, who is the Nor Norwegian designer. And um, I had my eye back then on one of her designs and... The translation for it into English is Mother Ors Jacket. I'm definitely saying that wrong. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, Cicel's mother is called Ors and she passed away while Cicel was working on the design, so the design is dedicated to her and named after her. It's a cardigan that's knitted in the round and steaked. It's a beautiful jacket. And it has some really interesting design elements to it, which I'm keen to talk to you about. But uh, first of all, I'll just tell you uh, a little bit about it. It comes into a it comes in a kit, and here are the colours. I'll try to put them all up here for you to have a look at. Uh, Cicel really likes to work with this fourth generation uh, Norwegian family run mill. That provide this wool, and it's uh, this wool is Usk, and the uh, Hillesvag, I think, is the fabric, the fa okay. factory. I'm saying all of that wrong, but show notes. It has some lovely sing-songy ring to yeah, it. Yeah, good Norwegian name. <laughs> okay, a beautiful Norwegian name. Yeah. So these are the colours. It, the pattern, the wool, this ribbon, which is silk, comes with it as well. The ribbon is going to be sewn down the front. And you get some mother of pearl buttons in various accompanying colours to the garment. So that's all included in the kit. So like I said, there's some really interesting design elements. So I want to talk to you about that now. And here's a picture of the design. And you can see that the all over body pattern is very easy. It's got a small pattern repeat, so it's easy to memorise. But Sistel has reversed the background and foreground colours on the back and the sleeves. So the two fronts of the cardigan have the pale icy blue as the background and the sleeves in the back have the lime green as the background. And around the hem and the cuff she's got a really nice thick border that looks very jewel-like, decorative and jewel-like in all the other colours that she's used. So. Nearly the whole garment is knitted with only two colours per row, but in this band, on a couple of the rows, she uses three colours instead of two. But as you can see, they're just tiny little pattern repeats, so it wasn't a problem just to to throw in the third colour. And I love the look of it. It just looks like little, little jewels, little lollies. <laughs> the other thing that's interesting, if you have a look at the garment, it looks like it's being seamed, but it hasn't. 
what she's done is used one pearl stitch in the background color going up in a column on each side of the garment where a side seam would normally be. And on either side of this one stitch pearl column, she's put in waist shaping. So that's an interesting effect. And then on the button bands, they're half knitted and half crocheted. So that's gonna be something that's new for me to do, which I'll, I'll really enjoy. So back to having a look at the work that I've done and I need your hands, Dals. Okay. So if we hold it this way, the first thing that you do is you start off knitting the lining in, in stocking stitch and that's this dark green color here. So that is later on, I'll quickly turn it around, that's gonna be uh, turned back and sewn under. So I've just pinned it back so you can see. So the final look is gonna be like this around the hem of the body. But you start that knitting that back and forth and then you do a pearl ridge here which is the turning point and you join your steak stitches. Uh, Sistel uses five but I use ten. That's an Alastair Moore method and I use the outer ones of um, to be sort of like the edge stitches and in those edge stitches I will pick up the button to knit the, the button bands and if you okay. do it like this, Sorry, I was they looking. can't see. I just wanted I know, to have a look. I know, but you can look later. Right. Sorry. <laughs> so here it's a checkered board of effect which kind of just holds the, the, the stitches together, this bit. And, and because it's um, eight stitches in the middle wide, it just gives you extra room to do your cutting and and, and for any stitches to unravel, it doesn't matter. So that's why I've yep. used ten. Didn't you say she um, reverses the colours on the front and the back? Yeah, but I didn't. Coming to that. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You've only just noticed it. No, I've been wondering about that for a bit. but. Okay. So that's how she does the hem, the hem on the body and how she used to do the hem on the sleeves. But then she started to enjoy the effect of leaving the lining hanging out and because it's stocking stitch it's just going to curl up on itself like this. So now she does the cuffs, she leaves them like this curling up which is an interesting effect because it's very decorative isn't it? Yep. Flamboyant. So if, and she uses the dark colour which is also a little bit here and it does add a, an extra border especially with the ridge. Yeah. So that's kind of an interesting thing that she does. So, yes, Andrew is right. I have made some changes to the pattern, just slight changes. But the first thing that is significant is the gauge. So Cecil recommends a gauge of 24 stitches and 32 rows. And the yarn that she uses is, to me, a typical four-ply fingering weight. And what I normally, uh, the gauge I normally get when I knit this kind of, of weight in, in Fair Isle or Stranded is 28 stitches to 32 rounds. That's a big difference. That means if I was to knit it up as written, my, my whole garment would be 10 to 12 centimetres small, too yeah. small. But you get the same gauge yes. vertically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I really prefer this firmer fabric. So that's what I want to do. But it does mean that I have to change the pattern somewhat. So I am knitting a, a bigger size than I normally would. And I'm changing it from the, the design of it goes down to low hip, that, like an hourglass. It's, it's um, got waist shaping and goes up. And mine is just going to be like a cropped jacket. So I will have it here. It'll sit a few centimetres lower than my belly button and I won't do any decreases for waist shaping so I'll have this band right here and I'll just increase two centimetres around the bust up here. So I'm going to have it like a sort of a tight fitting little um, cropped jacket yeah. that I can wear over a long shirt or a dress and because I want it really tailored I probably won't leave the lining rolling up, I will probably make it um, more sort of sharp lined on the cuff. Yep. But and you can make that decision right at the end, can't you? I can make that decision right at the end. And I also wanted to um, dampen the effect a little bit by 
keeping it the same uh, foreground and background colour all the way around. So because this is a steeped cardigan, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to introduce a steeped cowl. So we're going to start a, a cowl and Andrew has opted for it to be called the fruity steeped cowl because the fruity steeped garment cowl is too long. It's far too long. So we had a vote and we had to bring Jack in to make the deciding vote and he <laughs> voted for the fruity steeped cowl. <laughs> So that's the hashtag. <laughs> that's the ha we ha Jack yeah. is our dog. Our daughter's yeah. just left home. She's officially left home. She's in Australia now. Yep. We're missing her Yep, but terribly. she doesn't get a vote. So she can't vote. So Jack now has the deciding vote. <laughs> yep. Hear that, Madeline. <laughs> yes, we hope Madeline's watching to catch up on family yep. news. <laughs> so... Anyway, the rules for this cowl are it has to be a garment and it has to be steeped. Now, I know some people do steep a garment that is not ferrile or stranded colour work, so technically that is acceptable, but all over ferrile and stranded colour work designs are highly encouraged. Yeah. So please join in, and especially if you've never steeped before, because there's going to be a lot of back and forth chatter in the thread, and you're bound to learn a lot. Coming up now is our interview with the very lovely Hazel Tyndall. We um, interviewed Hazel on our first day in Shetland, and we were a little bit caught out. We had in our minds that it was going to be a little bit overcast, and we were looking for a nice light spot to do the interview. As it turned out, we arrived and it was blue skies, very sunny, and so this interview is slightly overexposed. We apologise for that. <laughs> um, it is a lovely interview. Hazel is very interesting, has some very interesting stories. After the interview, we enjoyed a home-cooked meal with Hazel, yeah. um, very traditional reested mutton and tatty soup. Yeah, um, it was great. Yeah, so enjoy the interview. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. I'm here in Shetland. It's a beautiful blue sky outside and I'm here sitting on the couch with Hazel Tyndall. It's a real privilege to get to meet her in person and to have a chat about her wonderful knitting and her experiences. Hazel has been given the title of the world's fastest knitter and she's been knitting since before she can remember. She comes from a family who had to knit for their income. It was a major part of their income. So that's very interesting and I thought we could start with sharing some memories of knitting when you were a child and uh, of the adults around you who were knitting. Well the adults around me would have been three generations. There was my grandmother, um, that's my dad's mother, and my mother who hated knitting and I had a maiden aunt, my dad's sister. She um, knitted a lot and she, her aim in life was to earn enough to buy herself an old age pension. It kept her going for 30 odd years, so she did well. Um, and also we had aunts that visited and everybody was knitting. They would always bring their knitting with them, except on Sundays. There was no knitting on Sundays. Okay. No, that was the day of rest and, and knitting wasn't allowed. I remember hearing a story about somebody setting the clock back an hour because she wanted to finish knitting on a Saturday <laughs> night. <laughs> and that was the only way she could do it if she pretended it was still Saturday. Oh, that's classic. So they were knitting all the time and one of my early memories was being sent up the hill to see, no, to look to see if my grandmother was coming back from the hill and she would have her knitting with her and a basket on her back. She would have been about 80 then. Yeah. So you were knitting as a child for money, weren't you, for pocket money? Probably from about the age of 12, yes. When I was at the school, it was a good way of getting some income. Um, and I would knit yokes into jumpers and cardigans, um, usually on a Saturday. Okay. Because when I went to school, we had to go and let to Lerwick on the Sunday night and we came home on Friday night. So we didn't have a lot of time at home. But before that, I would have, from the day that I could focus on a human, I would have been watching knitting going on. So I guess by the time 
I got to start knitting, I knew how it should look. Mm. And and so it made it easier. Yeah. So your family, you've mentioned that your mother didn't like knitting. Tell mm. us a bit about your mother. My mother much preferred to sit and read or write. She really loved to write. Um, and knitting was a chore because they needed the income. Yeah. Um, I've been through all her diaries for the 1960s and, and money was the big issue. Yeah. They, there just wasn't any. And and she would go to Lairwick and try to sell knitting. Um, in those days, you could get um, things on account. You know, you got mm-hmm. an invoice later and, and lots of the entries were, well, at least I've paid off such and such after she'd sold that bit okay. of knitting. Yeah. It was a real struggle. So knitting was not a pleasure for her. But yeah. she was very competent, yeah. you know, an able knitter. But didn't. And was it hard to sell your knitting or...? or Sometimes it, it was, yeah. yeah. It depended, I think, maybe on the mood of the buyer and whether she liked your face. And sometimes an adult could go with something and she, they would say no. But a child could maybe go the same, maybe not the same day, but another day with the same thing and they would be more likely to buy from the child. Okay. They were very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Your family or the aunts around you, were they mainly knitting Fair Isle or combination um, Fair Isle lace? My aunt that lived in the house with us, it was mostly open work that she did, um, and that's what we call lace. And she couldn't actually read a pattern. If, if you give her a piece of writing with instructions, she couldn't read it, but if you gave her something, yeah. she could replicate it okay. just from looking. And back in the sixties, you were you had pretty free reign designing, didn't you? You told me. Yeah, when when we could put in yokes, we could do anything that we wanted, um, any colours as long as we used the body colour once. That seemed to be the only rule, um, and I got really bored with the, you know, the star and the crab and the usual part. And so these are all ones that I made up when I was. In in my teens, just to relieve the boredom, and this is the two that I use most today. I think okay. this one's here. Ah yes. Um, and would you call that a star? A I call th- I call star? this a windmill. Ah, of course, <laughs> yes. But I don't have a name for this one. This is maybe more like a cross. But I quite like this one because you get the cross shape, but then you've got another little pattern in the middle. So you developed these yourself? Yeah. And yeah. What, when did you do that? Was that back in the 60s? Yeah, it would yeah. have been, yes, as a teenager, yeah. As a teenager, so you enjoyed then making up yeah. patterns? Yeah. yeah, you just sit and do the dots. And we always just used black on, or red on white. We didn't shade in, put in colours. Yeah. You just decide when you're knitting what colours it'll be. So here, that's a motive here, for instance, and you've got a, a yeah. half of a tree, haven't yes. you? Yes, yeah, that would yeah. have been... And so that's what you put in for easy decreases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. That you decrease along the side of the tree. And then towards the 70s, they started telling you what colours to use. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, they, they started dictating not just the colours to use, but when to change them and the patterns to use. And and that's just boring. That took all the fun out of it. Yeah, no no possibility of being creative. Yeah. And, and why no did fun. they do that? I think it was fashion. I think okay. I think that the buyers because yokes were exported by the thousand from Shetland in the sixties. Yeah. Okay. Lots of little firms. Um, I had of f- one lady not long ago I spoke to and and I said, I didn't realise you had a business, but I found that my mother had knitted for her. And she says, oh, yes, she'd um, gone to visit her brother somewhere in England and went into a shop and said, would you like Shetland knitting? And that was how her business began. But to end up with most of her export was to France. That's interesting, isn't it? So I suppose when they were starting to, to be exported by the thousands, they wanted to be able to have a hundred of this colour yeah. and a hundred of that colour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the buyer was, had said, yes. this is what we want. Yeah, very interesting. And the customers didn't get the same choice. 
This is an example of early knitting from you, isn't it? Yeah, I think this is the first fair old, um garment that I knitted for myself. Okay, so how old would you have been? Well, I was still at primary school, so I would have been 11, I think. It's beautiful, and it's with all the natural shades, isn't it? Yes, yes. The, you can't really go wrong with the undyed yarn. And this one, you can see this is a dark fawn that comes as a background yes. further up. Yes. Um, and it's got shaped sleeves. Yes, yeah, set in sleeves. Set in sleeves, that, yeah. yeah. So just very quickly, while we're still on the on memory lane, down memory mm. lane, what can you tell us about the social events? Because I've heard that typically um, when you went and visited people, mm. everyone would be knitting. So yeah. just describe that scene for a little bit. Well, when I was, we got the first TV in the middle of the 1960s, I think. And, bef well, even then people would go visiting. Every winter you would visit X, Y and Z and then they would, pay a return visit and everybody always had their knitting or the ladies did I don't know any men that hand knit um, and you would look to see what they were doing and it would be discussed and and my next door neighbour um, was always knitting and I would go and visit her a lot she knitted all over jumpers the neighbour on the other side was nearly always doing the cockle shell scarf okay and it took me a it was Probably in my teens before I tried much lace because I remember seeing lace knitting and I said to my mother, I, I would like to do that. And she said, it's too hard, stick to the fairer. <laughs> so, <laughs> And what did your mother think of you loving to knit so much? Was she, she flabbergasted? She couldn't understand it. <laughs> no, she didn't. She really didn't understand it. So, Hazel, in Shetland, I've heard that a lot of knitters um, can knit very proficiently sh uh, Shetland lace and Fair Isle, but they tend to prefer one technique over mm -hmm. the other. You obviously love Fair Isle. Yes. So why do you particularly love Fair Isle? Well, I just love the colour. I love the the different shapes that you can create. And, yeah. and it's just more fun than lace. Yeah. lace. Lace, you have to wait a while to see the result whereas fair I'll, you can see it after and that's true yeah immediately can't yeah. you yeah it's very fascinating and I love having two yarns in both hands do you mm -hmm. there's a rhythm to that yeah. that you don't get from anything else exactly yeah exactly I think I fall into that category mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. <laughs> so um there's a lot of different colours that you can work with Fair Isle. You know, there's in the Shetland Fleece alone, it produces so many gorgeous natural mm. colours. And you've got very vivid colours and muted, earthy colours. So what do you prefer to work with? What kinds of colours? Oh, bright. Bright? <laughs> Usually bright. Usually blue. Blue and red, I guess. Okay. Blue, red, pink. Yeah. Maybe a bit of purple. Not a lot of green and brown, but you can't help what you're attracted yeah, to exactly yeah exactly so could you give us some tips on how to create a beautiful fair isle color work project just so to be creative it's, but make sure it's beautiful at the end result <laughs> i would say if you're going to start and you're not sure just have one color as your background this is one background color mm -hmm. with uh, I think there's five or six patron colours. Mm -hmm. And then on the sleeve I swapped it so the patron is white and and the part and the background is just is shading colour, in is yeah. shading. I see that. And and you shouldn't really notice when you're changing from one colour to the next. I don't like stripes and Yeah. And looking at the table I see everything I've pulled out today for you is panels, which is this one going yes. straight up yeah um and partly that's because i think if you're short and stout you don't want horizontal but i don't really like the oxo yeah. patterns yeah. much and it's much easier when you go up in columns once you've set the pattern then that's it and with colors fading into each other it gives mm. more of a flow doesn't it yeah. it's easier on the eyes yeah yes yeah. it is you shouldn't have any harsh half shocks like going from this to this is really quite dramatic quite a, a, yes so you need something to calm it down even even this this one would calm yeah yeah you wouldn't want much of these two colors probably yeah, yeah. 
but this would, would so always trying to fade a little bit or even that one yes that looks lovely doesn't it yeah but I would hate to be choosing colours from a shade cat and we're just so lucky to have yeah. so many colours yeah. available so if you were to take some muted colours then for those who like to work with muteds how can you brighten them up mm. could you give us a little example yeah you well, this this is actually... Um, so all the colours you don't like. With the the colours I don't like. Mm, yeah. <laughs> the colours that I like. <laughs> How would you liven it up a same. bit? See, those two blend quite nicely together. Yeah. Um, and a bit of yellow always goes yeah. well with, with greens. Um, yeah. As the middle line. But this, this would be a background colour, oh, I okay. would say, and, or, or vice versa. Okay. Um, and you could... You could probably get away with this one as a background, but you would have, because they kind of flow together, yes, but you would need true. to get something dark to go with it. So those colours could go together. Yeah. So do yeah. you do that when you're um, creating a new pattern? You just get your colours around and put them together and then rearrange mm. them? Is that what you... No. No? <laughs> no, I usually start with two Start and then, with two and then see what happens. And see what happens, yeah. Okay. There's not a lot of planning. Yeah. There's not a lot of swatching. And what and have you got here that you can show us about? So this one, you can see that the darkest background colour is here and then this is the darkest part and that's the shape making. And it gets a bit lighter and the background gets a little bit lighter. Background lighter again, but this stays fairly constant. And then... I've just put a little bit of orange across the middle. And one of the things I very rarely do is to change both colours in one row. Yes. So I've got the the darkest red for four rows here, but the navy is just for three. Yes. And that kind of softens it the, does, doesn't the it? changes. Yeah. It's like painting, really, isn't it? It is. It's yeah. just like blurring the edges a bit. Yeah. I say you, you look at it like a landscape where you have the background that's that's here and then you have your your shapes that go on top. Yeah. And this one I pulled this one out because these aren't really my kind of colors but but I knitted it anyhow. <laughs> and this is the same green but it looks entirely different because it's on this really deep color and there's a big contrast. There's not so much contrast here, so it looks like two different greens. It does, doesn't it? That yeah. is very muted and that mm -hmm. really pops out. Yeah, yeah. But you can always, you should always be able to see the shape that you're knitting. There's no point in making a nice shape if you yeah. can't see it because exactly. the colours are wrong. So you still have to be true to the motive, mm -hmm. don't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's traditional that it it's muddered across the centre. So this is a centre here, yeah. although this is the actual motif here. And do you have them at regular interview intervals, the centres? Or uh, I suppose you can change that with the periods, yeah. can't you? Um, well, the period pattern just has to fit in. And this one was made to fit <laughs> so that it's always at the same point, at the same colours. And, and when you're thinking about your jumper, you're thinking about what's going to start, be at the shoulders and yeah. the centre front. OK. Yes. And, and this is just a fuller. Yes. Yeah. So it's very musical. It's all about the main theme and the mm. secondary theme. And <laughs> I know nothing about music. <laughs> but I think the, the arts, they interweave with mm -hmm. the concepts. Mm -hmm. So Shetland Wool Week is starting, I think, tomorrow and Hazel has got quite a few classes that she'll be teaching and one of them is about constructing yokes. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit now what you're teaching? I think you're talking about how to do decreases yeah. in amongst the motives and colour choices. Yeah, they just get a, a, a little bit of a sample to do and we look at a lot of yokes. You can see there's a few here. But my starting point is always um, how we used to get the raw material back in the 60s, and this is machine knitted, um, and we had to put on the cuffs ourselves and pick up the stitches. It usually meant ripping back a row because the machinist would, would have a little bit spare, and we picked up the stitches and marked the stitch at the centre front and the centre back. Now, we knew the front and the back 
because there's extra rows on the front on the, on back, the back yeah so that that gives you the height yes um because nobody had bothered with short rows that yeah that was too much work um and so this is how we got the raw material and it was turned in to this which is beautiful and you have you can see that this is at the center front yes Yes, and, and you've if used, it's off, you can see it. Yeah, you can, mm -hmm. and you've used a, a very similar background colour that it almost yeah. looks like this, but it's not. It's got it's, it's heathered, it's slightly different. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. And I've started with a dark colour at the edge, and that's sometimes a nice way to say I'm here. <laughs> that's where I start, and then it's got lighter towards the middle. Um, yes, it gives it a luminescence, yeah. sort of right through the middle. Yeah. yeah, but it's a nice place to try playing with colours. That's beautiful. So and, what have we got here? Well, this this one, seeing as we're speaking about colours, this one is really quite quite bright. Um, there's a little green wave here, and you can see that there's just two colours in the row. This is where you would be tempted to put in three, but yes. that's too much work. And then we've we've sort of started on bright colour, and then it's a little bit f paler or muted mm -hmm. as you go to the centre, and then we've got this really zingy red which doesn't clash with the the orange and after or tan would you call this orange yes. tangerine yeah um and then a bit of yellow across the middle as well yes so it it works although this color hasn't been used in the yolk at yes. all because it's a, just a variation on it this is. color isn't yeah. it yeah 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 so and i can also see that you've changed the background color here yes just very slightly. Very slightly, yes. You shouldn't. So there's a, a white here, and then this is pale lemon, and this is more of a, a goldish tinge, and then a, a yellow lemon. And your mother knitted this? Yes. And, and the decreases are going up the side of this thing, but it's all two together. There's no slanting of the, the decreases here. Okay. And what about this one? And the tree was was a favourite way of shaping a yoke. Um, you've put the tree um, branches out and then once you get just before the middle, mm -hmm. you start decreasing every second row. And these decreases are two together at this side and this has been a, a, a slanting increase into the centre of the tree. And that was used very commonly. But this design here is not common, is it? No, that's one of the ones that I made up a when long you're time ago. A teenager. It's like a flower, but it's not intuitive. This one, I always have to look it up. And you can vary it by changing the centre, yeah. which makes it more yeah. attractive. That's lovely. And this one is... Um, this is what my mother called mice teeth here, <laughs> one on one. I don't know why, but... Um, and there would have been no decreases... Um, until you got this wave done, and then there wouldn't have been very many because okay. you don't do the much shaping before you get to the centre. And because of this pattern, the decreases are, are made here and here and again here before the neck. Okay, so are you only decreasing then perhaps three, like here occasionally, but yeah. more stronger uh, here and I here? I would say this is maybe three and two together along here. Okay. I think that's two and two together. So, but no yeah. decreasing through the centre? No decreasing, no. No, there's no decreases here because this is the same as this. Yeah. That's lovely. And she's used a black and white, a I black and red I, yeah. heathered yarn here, hasn't yeah. she? So yeah. And then it's gone into a, a plain a red. plain red and plain black. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So even though she hated knitting, she wasn't bad at it. No, no, she was very able. <laughs> I think this is one of the patterns that, that they were ordered to use, but I guess she changed the colours. Yeah. Sometimes if you want to look at colour, you see it more clearly on the back. Yes. Yeah. And that's another one. These will be your colours. Yes. I love <laughs> this green. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> not my choice. I'm wondering if she's actually used three colours here. No, I don't think so. Um, but again, the decrease there'll be a few decreases here, and then more up here. Now I think this is too pale for my taste, but it's nice. 
it's subtle. Yeah, subtle. They all date back to the 60s, 70s? These are, these are all from the 60s and probably one or two from the 70s, yeah. This is definitely your colours, isn't it? Yeah, I quite like that one. Beautiful. Yeah. And you've just uh, t- recently released a DVD called 50 Knitting Tips together with Elizabeth Johnston. Mm-hmm. So that's coming out now. Um, what kind of a knitter is that suited for and what, are you, what did you cover in the DVD? Oh, well, we try to cover everything. Elizabeth and I do workshops and inevitably we're asked the same questions. Can you show us how you do this, that and the other? So it sort of began from that and then it just grew and so it really began as trying to answer the most commonly asked questions and and adding in a bit so what kind of knitter is it there's something there obviously for the beginner and intermediate but also for advanced knitters they're probably likely to find a tip or two that they haven't seen I i think so i spoke to a shetland knitter not long ago and she says oh i found out how to work out how many how long a thread I need to cast on stitches. She said, I didn't know that. And she was a bit older than me. Yeah. So I think that if... I know I learned from Elizabeth and she learned something from me. Um, So I'm sure that most people will pick up something from it. Well, it's been so wonderful to spend this afternoon with you, to, to sit in your home, to look at your gorgeous collection of knitting. So thank you so much, Hazel, for being on the Fruity Knitting Podcast. You're very welcome. <laughs> so we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. During the Wool Week, Marie Wallen launched her latest collection of designs, which was inspired by Shetland and called Shetland. And as many of you know, I'm a huge fan of her work and can't resist knitting her designs. So I've got myself a copy of her uh, book, Shetland. And the book, the designs in the book are based on or using the spin drift by Jamiesons of Shetland. And I've got some of the the colours here to show you. And this is a two-ply yarn, but it is uh, equivalent to a traditional four-ply weight yarn. They come in really beautiful colours. There they are there. And I have enough for two of the designs. I bought enough yarn for two of the designs in this collection. We interviewed Marie Wallen and she talks about her collection and the inspiration behind it and shows you the designs, but that's coming up in an an episode in the future. And I will also talk more about the designs that I've picked out to knit later, but I just wanted to talk to you about Jamiesons of Shetland because they also produce beautiful woven tweed fabrics, as you can see here. And as you know, I had a break from knitting during the summer months because I had arm pains and I delved into sewing during this time. So I knew that I wanted to go to the mill to pick up some tweed fabric to make into skirts. And I did. Here is this tweed. It's a beautiful purple, which is going to go with almost everything that I've knitted already. And this fabric here perhaps my favorite I think it's it's really beautiful and and light and yeah so I love it so here are the colors here there are so many of them they're all gorgeous as you can see tumbling around <laughs> and what's really interesting is that the yarns for knitting and the yarn in the tweed are the same so you can see for example this is a heathered orangey color and there it is there it's that orange stripe exactly and the purple here that's very very close that purple there is this one here maybe a little bit of that that in it and you can see there's a a mustard stripe here that's this yarn And, and the colors are just heathered they're muted you can just put them all together and it's going to go with everything which yeah. i love So you can make yourself a complete outfit, (laughs) very, very matchy, matchy. So, and and the yarns are just stunning colours. They're just beautiful. Look at them all. Yeah, it was amazing (laughs) at the mill to actually see all of the colours. They had the 
the wall with a complete selection yeah. there. And they're grouped by the, the different tones. So. And they all just they all just blend in beautifully. Yeah. And that's such an interesting colour too, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So Andrew and I took a trip to the mill, like I said, and we made a little film or footage of it to share with you. To get to Jamieson's of Shetland, you take a narrow, winding road across some remote and atmospheric moorlands. There's plenty of sheep sometimes lying down on the road and they reluctantly get up for you when your car is too close for comfort. There's also plenty of Shetland ponies. They're very much like smoochy dogs and they love to come up for a scratch and hopefully something to eat and Andrew couldn't resist them. So here's the mill in the middle of nowhere They have a little shop at the entrance. This is their famous Shetland two-ply spin drift. It's equivalent to a traditional four-ply and it comes in over 220 colours. And they also sell some finished garments and scarves. We were very lucky to be able to have a look around inside the mill and the owner, Elaine Jamieson, is showing us first the raw, dirty fleece as it comes in from the farmers. And this wool has been dyed and mixed for heathered yarns. Here the skeins are being washed. And then later spun dry. This was my favourite machine, the ball winder. And here was the room where the machine knitting took place. And some Shetland ladies doing all the finishing on the jumpers. Brian is the head weaver and he's responsible for producing the very beautiful Shetland tweeds and blankets that they've got on sale. He makes up most of the patterns. Brian is a man of very few words, but I was lucky enough to get his advice to help me choose some tweed skirt material. We also visited Jamison and Smith, which is the other major yarn producer on Shetland, and they are also wool broker for many of the crofters on Shetland. Um, whilst we were there, we did catch a bit of the talk from Oliver Henry. He was talking about grading the wools or sorting the wools into the different classes, which is really interesting. There'll be a little bit of that in one of our upcoming episodes. Um, I did also want to remind our Shetland and Merino patrons that we have an event coming up with Nancy Marchant on October 14th. Um, Nancy is obviously the major authority on brioche knitting. This should be a really interesting event, very um, exciting to have her in person or (laughs) virtually in person. Um, For Merinos and Shetlands, please do get your questions in so that we can get them to Nancy before the event. So she can have a look over at them. Yeah. Yeah. We want to thank all of our patrons for your continuing financial support. We are independent. We don't receive money from advertising or sponsorship. It's very much a full-time job, which means that we are totally reliant on the financial support of our patrons to be able to continue. So we do ask you, if you value our show and you enjoy watching it, to please become a patron. And you can do so for the cost of a couple of coffees per month. So thank you. We're coming up now to the second interview with Dr. Carol Christensen, the curator of the textile collection at the Shetland Museum. 
Carol very kindly put together a small collection of hand knitted garments from the early 20th century that are sort of her favourite pieces or some of her favourite pieces. And one of the garments in particular is a, a very fine hand knitted undergarment for a fisherman and it's wonderful the way it's been constructed and I keep thinking of these companies like Patagonia who specialise in um, outdoor, outdoor yeah. or extreme yeah. adventurous sports yeah. kind of, of equipment that is really tailor-made for, for extreme weather and, and activities. Yeah. And I keep thinking also of the podcast Fibre Trek, Sarah. Her husband is a ranger in the northern Maine woods and he does canoeing and he does a lot of physical activity. He yep. also knits. So, Rob, if you're watching this, <laughs> you might want to really check out this fisherman's garment and um, yeah, adapt I've, it to your needs. Yeah, I found this really fascinating. It's just amazing to get this connection to this past time when these guys were out there without all the high-tech um, garments that we have now and they're having to cope with the weather. Yeah. You know? So Carol also shows some beautiful Shetland uh, lace knitting and a very suave, gorgeous t uh, 20s male waistcoat. So that's in there. She also talks about the Gunnister Man that she was heavily involved in. That was a set of clothing that was dug up from Pete's that dated back to the 17th century. So it's a very in interesting interview and we hope you really enjoy it. And we'll see you soon with some more uh, Shetland content and other knitting. So yep. <laughs> have fun and yep. see you next time. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. guest today is Dr. Carol Christensen. Dr. Carol Christensen is the curator of the textile collection at the Shetland Museum and Archives here in Lerwick. And this collection is mainly 19th and 20th century handmade cloth, both woven and knitted. And apart from her duties as curator, Carol publishes articles and books. She researches Shetland textiles and occasionally she does analysis on um, textiles that were found in archaeological digs. So that just sounds such interesting and fascinating work. <laughs> and I really want to thank you for taking time in this really busy Shetland Wool Week to come and speak to us and share your experience and knowledge on the podcast. So thank you and welcome. Well, thank you for having me. So let's just start off with how did you come here to be, in to be living in Shetland and working as a curator? Well, I, I'm originally from Seattle in the United States, and I wanted to study archaeological textiles, and so I came to Britain in 1997 to do a PhD on archaeological textiles, and my research was mainly in Shetland, and so I did my field work and my writing up here, and I just eventually started working here and moved here and worked as an archaeologist for about five years and then I got the job at the Shetland Museum and Archives because we were developing a new museum and they needed a textile specialist. And one of the areas you've done a lot of research in is early sheep breeds and their fleeces, the characteristics and what kinds of textiles they can make out of them. So can you just teach us something today about that as it relates to Shetland and the Shetland sheep and the knitting culture that developed here? Okay. Um, well, my early research on archaeological material was to look at how people use wool as a raw material and the different things that they can make out of it, but also the tools they have to sort of deconstruct the fleece and manipulate the fleece in certain ways to create different quality textiles. And the great thing about the Shetland um, breed is that it, it grows a fleece which has different qualities in it. 
I mean, there are many breeds in Northern Europe that are like that, but in Britain, Shetland still stands out as a indigenous breed that has these unique qualities. So within one fleece, you have various qualities of wool. And if you, like I say, deconstruct the fleece, you can get different qualities that you can do different things with. For example, you can use coarse fleece for uh, making, say, blankets um, or other household textiles or outerwear, but you can also use the really fine, shorter fibers um, for things like baby clothes. So within one fleece, you actually have a full range of wool qualities. Okay. And tell us something about the Gunnister man, because he's very interesting. He was wearing various different textiles, wasn't he? And he was... So maybe for people who don't know the Gunnister man, tell us a little bit how he was found. Well, in 1951, there were two men in the northern part of Shetland who were um, cutting peat for fuel, and they came across... uh, a set of woolen clothing and and that woolen clothing was laid out in the peat and they soon realized that this was a burial. Um, there was, really wasn't very much left of the human that was in there. Um, there were a few bones and some fingernails and toenails and a little bit of hair but other than that it was really his woolen clothing and other textiles that survived because the peat is very acidic and wool likes acid. These clothing, the clothing was, well, the whole body was excavated out, really, um, the burial was, and then eventually it went to the National Museum in Edinburgh, where it, where it remains. But when we created our new museum in Shetland, we wanted to represent the Gunnister Man, um, because he came from a period that we don't know a huge amount about in we we know that he dated from about the year 1700 because he had a little knitted purse and in there there were Swedish and Dutch coins which dated to the 1680s and 1690s so we say that he dates from about the year 1700 but he had on a full set of clothing and in total he had 14 different garments but within that he had really 20 different textiles because he had patches and linings in some of the clothing. Um, It was both woven and knitted, and we decided to reconstruct the Gunnister Man outfit so we could put it on display on a mannequin. So we set about doing this, and one of the things we wanted to do in this project was to test whether all of the clothing could be made out of Shetland wool because we didn't know where this person had come from. So I worked with two Swedish colleagues um, in spinning, weaving, dyeing some, um, and really putting together his whole outfit. Um, And we, we did manage to make most of the clothing out of Shetland fleece, but um, there were his two caps, which are white, originally they were white, um, we used some um, indigenous Swedish wool. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I thought one thing that was interesting that you said to me is that it was hard to know what kind of a social level he was at because his clothes, they were made like a worker's clothes, but the style of them was sort of in the style of someone who was higher up, like the, the, the way his coat was, I think you mentioned, it was a little bit more mm. flamboyant or mm. dressy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He had on a, a real mixture of clothing because he had on a, a suit, which cons- consisted of short, really short, wide breeches and a, a long coat, the length of which came to just above the end of the breeches, but the coat was very stylish with a rather full skirt on it and big bell sleeves. I mean, that you see in paintings of men from the period, but his was made out of rather rough wool. So he was, he looked fashionable in a way, but the fabric was kind of everyday fabric. He had on um, what we think were what we call here rivlins, which were hide shoes. 
and maybe he had on he had other shoes to begin with and they wore out and he was he ended up having to use um shoes made locally but um so he had this odd mixture of of kind of rough clothing but also fairly new fashionable clothing yeah interesting mm. and in front of us as you can probably see we have got some really beautiful garments that um are part of the collection that Carol curates and Carol has brought them along to show us some of the interesting things, the way they've been constructed or the material that's been used. So thank you so much for doing that. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. This is actually one of my favorite pieces in the collection. And as you can see, it's extremely plain. But what I like about it is the way it was made because it's what I consider an engineered textile and we often talk about engineered textiles today in terms of modern textile production. But people were doing it a long time ago as well. This was made by a woman for a relative who was a man. And this is essentially a man's underwear, the top part. And he was a fisherman. And in Shetland, when you were a fisherman, you rowed in a big open boat far out to sea and you had no other protection against the weather other than the clothes you wore. So this was a hand spun, hand knitted garment. It's very soft and it's extremely lightweight. You can see it's very long so it covers the torso and it covers all the vital organs in your body. And when you're rowing in a boat, your upper body is moving, but your lower body is not. And so you have to have clothing on that keeps your vital organs like your liver and kidneys warm. You can see here that there's a split in the bottom where she's made um, an opening because it needs to be comfortable around the hips. It's knit completely in the round. Up here, there is a little bit of decoration along the sleeve edge um, and there's an opening here because as you row a boat you need freedom of movement and that also meant that the garment wasn't strained at this point otherwise she might have had to do repairs on this part under the arm. You can see the sleeves are very short because if you have long sleeves and your cuffs get wet that cools your body very quickly, so you want short sleeves. It, it has no seams, there's just grafting here at the shoulders, so there's no bulky bits or parts to press onto your body to make it uncomfortable. So it's a really ideal garment for somebody who's out for 24, 48 hours in an open boat, um, exposed to all weathers, the cold, the damp, but they need to be warm and they need to be comfortable and they need to be able to move. And that's homespun. Is that a two-ply? It's, it's finer than jumper weight, isn't it? It's, it's more it is, lace weight, isn't it? It's, it is finer than jumper weight, but it's, um, it is two-ply. Um, Do they know if it's woolen spun? Mm, it's, it's looking a little bit... It's a bit between, and this has been worn, so it's a bit fuzzy. Yeah, so it might be hard to tell. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Well, what a caring wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, great. I've brought along two parts, well, two sleeves, of which you can see there are only parts of them. Um, we accept any bit of knitting, really, because as long as we have a re pattern repeat, it's useful because designers come and look at um, samples that we have, bits that people cut out of jumpers, to save for the patterns and um, they're always useful to someone. So we do have these kinds of pieces in our collection. But what makes these pieces special is the fact that um, the, the colors in them are, they're natural dyed colors and these are the typical early ferrile colors. Blue, usually from indigo, possibly from wood, but more likely indigo. We have red, which was made from madder or a mixture of madder and lichen dyes. Um, then we have yellow, which was various plant dyes, the natural brown or what we call Shetland black, dark brown, 
and then natural white. But these colors are really jewel-like because they are variegated, because the dyeing was slightly uneven. But to me, that makes it even more beautiful because you get a depth of color to it. If you see here, there are various reds in here. But when your eye just looks at that in general, you see a real richness to it. And so that's why I, I really like these pieces. And they've been knitted from the top down to the cuff, is that right? Yeah, that, that is the typical way that Shetlanders um, did sleeves. This sleeveless pullover was made for a man, and it was made in the late 1920s or early 1930s. And it represents um, a phase of feral knitting where um, knitters were reliant on using store-bought yarns that were machine-made and dyed with chemical dyes. In this case, um, there is a rayon yarn mixed with woolen yarn. Um, so you see a, an interesting change in texture on the surface of this. It's not just um, the colors that are, that are vibrant, but also there's a, there's a textural element to this because some colors are wool, and so they're a bit fuzzy, and other ones are rayon, and they're quite smooth and shiny. And so there's just this lovely mix in this waistcoat, which was meant to be um, worn under a jacket. And so even though it's really highly decorative, you'd only see a small bit of it that would kind of leap out under the jacket. Just the way men wore really um, decorative waistcoats in centuries before. So it's just carrying on that tradition only in feral knit. It's really beautiful. I always think of painting because, as you said, you've got some apricot wool here just on the corners of the gold shiny rayon. And it's it's just like it feathers the colour in, doesn't it? It... it, it um, blends the color a little bit. It does. There, there, there are colors in here that you wouldn't expect to go together, like a, a lime green and a silvery blue and an apricot and a deep red, and yet somehow it works. And so that has been, uh, is, there, is there a seams in this or it's been knitted in the round? It's knitted in the round. And mm -hmm. then probably grafted at the shoulders. Mm. Yeah, yes. It's gorgeous. And it's got that real elegant style of the 20s, hasn't it? It does, and it has these lovely decorative features around the edges where they've used the colors to, in a way, make it stand out even more. I've brought along a piece of Shetland fine lace. We have a very large collection of this kind of textile, and um, they're really exquisite, as you can see from this particular piece. For me, what makes them really amazing is not just the knitting and the design of it, but the, the spinning. Because with Shetland Fine Lace, you have to have a very fine but extremely even yarn. Otherwise, the pattern changes because your gauge changes and you get uh, sometimes a fuzziness if the yarn is slightly thicker than... Um, other parts of it. So the spinner had to be really skilled at what she did. This one is a single yarn um, and you can see that it's extremely fine quality and even throughout. This is a, a stole or a scarf and it's really made in three sections. The first is this border section here which has a number of different patterns in diamond shapes, but they have different fillings in them. And then there's a little bit of pattern here of a different kind. And then you see this row here, which is your transition space between the border and the main body of the garment. And so the center pattern, there are several here. There's this puzzle pattern and then these... Um, in-between patterns. Then at the other end there's another 
section of border and then you have your lace edging all the way around and the way these were constructed is that they were knit from the bottom of the border all the way up to the end of the center section then the other border was knit and it was grafted together the graft of this one is on the other end because you can tell here that this part wasn't grafted yeah it's just thinking that mm. and then you have your lace edge which is put on at the end it is exquisitely beautiful and it's so fine it would put a spider to shame it is amazing and it has to stay strong as well as being fine doesn't it because if it breaks it can easily unravel into quite a big hole yes and it's really difficult to repair these although in the past there were people who specialized in lace repair and lace dressing so if you bought one of these from Shetland you could send it back to Shetland and have it have it fixed or and then have it dressed again ready for you to wear well I am just so grateful that you've taken the time to show us this beautiful beautiful work so thank you and thank you also for your passion and the work that you do to to preserve this heritage well thank you for inviting me it was a great pleasure to show you some pieces from our collection. Great, okay. Well, we'll say goodbye to the viewers and we hope that you've really enjoyed it as much as I have. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. <clears throat> I just gotta check out my bald patch the whole episode. You ready? Yeah, I'm gonna get wool transplanted into my head. <laughs> <laughs> A bit of more. <laughs> more. <laughs>